Well, welcome. Get myself together here real quickly. We want to, for those who are joining on Facebook, like to welcome you. If it's your first time joining us, we're glad that you are. And uh, please, uh, for those who are on Facebook, please uh, comment. That way we know you're here and uh, we can interact with you that way. So for those of us who are here this morning, I uh, just want to go over a couple things um, that are coming up, some dates that we can uh, get put put down. So uh, I'm going to have Patty come up real quick, and she's going to give an announcement about an upcoming fundraiser event. Maybe she could borrow the microphone that Betty has right now. Yeah. And there's a switch on the bottom. Good morning, everybody. Um, Kevin Barber and I met with um, a gentleman from the Alps Club this week, and they gave us a date that we could use for a chicken barbecue, which is going to be October 18th, which is a Sunday morning. But we've talked to Jamie, and we're going to figure out how to work it, work the service. But um, I have envelopes made up with tickets in them. Tickets are going to be $10 each. It's a half a chicken, salt potatoes, and baked beans. Um, we're trying to do all tickets as pre-sale. So we can sell up to 300 tickets. Elks Club allows for an extra 100, which we would make money on also because um, they have like walk-ins that come regularly. And I have written down in the envelopes with the um, um, tickets, mostly what I'm going to read to you guys. Um, with directions, where to make checks payable to, how to get a hold of me, things like that. We can really make some pretty decent money from this if we can try and sell 300. Um, I'm going to give everybody 10 tickets, and if you find that you're not selling them or whatever, um, just let me know so we can try and pass them on to somebody else to see if they can sell more. Um, there's going to be, um, you can pick up orders between an 11 and 1 at the Carthage Elks Lodge. If someone wants to make write a check, it's uh, made payable to the Carthage Elks Lodge. We're also going to try and do a bake sale that day. So in the upcoming weeks, I'll um, put up a, you know, send a clipboard around to see who can make baked goods, and we'll need them by 10 o'clock that morning. Or if you need to drop them off at church the day before or whatever, I'll make sure I'll set up a time that I can be here so that I can get them. Um, also, Sandy and I talked about doing a can drive that day um, because we'll get other people there besides, you know, our normal um, church group. But if you have any questions, my phone number is going to be at the bottom of this page that I hand out to you guys. And also, the Elks Club is looking for pallets to um, that are not um, treated with anything because they use pallets to for the fire for the chicken. So if anybody has any thoughts or any ideas of where you can get pallets from, they would love to get some because they're always looking for them. And if anybody has any questions, just let me know. Thank you. For that. And uh, also, uh, we want to give you guys a couple more upcoming uh, on the, the 12th, not 12th, the 19th is going to be a rummage sale out here in our parking lot. And so what we're doing is if you have some things that you have put away that you'd like to try to get rid of, we are going to have tables set up out here on that Saturday, and any money that comes, it's all going to be based on donation. People just, whatever they want to donate, all of it will go to the parking lot. And so um, there's a, the classroom, as you walk in the far gym door, the first one, and there's a sign that says rummage sale. If you have some things, bring them in. And we're just going to store everything in there. And then on that Saturday, we will put everything out here, uh, open for the community. And anything that comes on that will go towards the parking lot. So please, if you have anything that you want to get rid of, uh, please, uh, you can uh, talk to Tiffany or Sandy or just drop it off uh, during the week in that room. And it will be known to go towards that. 
If it's during the day, you'll be all right. If it's uh, more in the evening, just let me know so we can make arrangements. There is also this week, uh, if, if you guys have not heard yet, uh, Debbie uh, Reynolds uh, Gordon passed away Friday morning. So this coming Wednesday, uh, here at the church, there's going to be a uh, viewing, and uh, at 11 o'clock to 1, 1 o'clock will be the funeral. And so uh, people are welcome to come to that and attend the service for Gordon. And then following that, uh, Debbie is going to have some family here that are going to go back to her home for a meal. And so uh, if you think you could uh, help with uh, getting some food, please see Wilma or Martha. They're going to be working on getting some stuff. So if you'd like to prepare a dish, just let them know, and we're going to get the food over to Debbie's house uh, on Wednesday so she and her family can have that meal following the service here. So uh, keep Deb. Uh, Deb and I met yesterday, and um, Gordon uh, knew the Lord. Uh, Debbie knows the Lord. So it's a, it's, it's a celebration, a homecoming for Gordon that we're going to have here Wednesday. So uh, please, if you want to come, if you're available, as we remember the life of Gordon and celebrate uh, his new life now as he uh, is with the Lord. So and that will be Wednesday, and then also the month of September is Alabaster. And so if you've been uh, collecting for that and putting back for Alabaster, we will be doing that in September. Uh, we'll have a date for you. I don't have the date unless, Deb, you know the specific Sundays, but... We will uh, have that next week available for Alabaster Sunday. So other than that, uh, those are just a few things that you can mark as we have upcoming. Let's uh, stand together, and I'm just going to pray, and then Betty's going to come, and, and she's going to read a scripture for us this morning. Uh, Father, we, we are so thankful this morning that we can come into a place corporately together to worship and uh, to give our praise to you alone. And so, Holy Spirit, we just anticipate today in our time that you are going to move in such a way to release to all of us the knowledge of Jesus' power and his presence upon us, upon our community. And so we just, right now, we, we clear our minds, we clear our hearts of anything and we just step into a, a place where you're exalted and your holiness that fills this place would just uh, awaken our own hearts, awaken our own minds to your goodness, to your mercy and love. And we just uh, anticipate that today as we worship in this, in this environment that we're going to create a place for your presence to be free to minister to us as we minister to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is Psalm 84, 1 through 4. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar. O Lord Almighty, my God, and my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we are so thankful to be here this morning, Lord, and we just praise your name, Lord, and ask that you would just uh, open our ears and open our hearts, Lord, to what the message would be today, Lord. Just anoint pastors preaching and just uh, give us your message today, Father, and be with those who can't be here, and, and uh, we are thankful for those who can join us through the media and we just praise you and thank you lord for all your goodness and for this day blessed in jesus name we pray amen my 
Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere, than thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, thousands elsewhere. My heart and flesh cry out, who you the living God, your spirit's water for my soul. I've tasted and I've seen, come once again to me, I will draw near to you, I will draw near to you, better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, thousands elsewhere, better is one day in your courts, better is one day elsewhere sing that again better is one day in your courts better is one day in your house better is one day in your courts thousands elsewhere better is one day in your courts better is one day in your house better is one day in your courts thousands elsewhere thousands elsewhere
the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us. Let it Scriptures tell us, Ephesians chapter 2, that we were once alienated, separated from God because of sin, but Christ has brought us, tearing down, it says, the dividing wall of hostility. And this morning, 
Father, we are so thankful for the work of Christ in our lives. Brings us from death to life. Gives us new life. Gives us the fullness of life. Gives us the abundance, the, the life that you, you want us to have. And so the posture that we bring for what you've done in our lives to you in service. And so here we bow to raise you high. Jesus, will you be glorified in all life and all the things that are done, all the things that are said. Everything that we do would be glorifying to you. Our worship this morning be glorifying to you because it is, it is your presence that is central to the church. Everything we do is because of you, Jesus. And we thank you for that this morning. And may we today have an opportunity, if we've not, to make you the Lord of our life. To surrender everything. And then to live in obedience to you as a spiritual act of worship. We just honor you this morning. We, we thank you. We bless you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Before we move on, I want to invite Barbara. She's, this is her final Sunday with us. And I um, just want to bless, bless her as she goes. Barbara, if you'd come down real quick. Just invite you to just lay your hands out um, on as she comes, as she um, begins her new journey. She's moving this week to uh, Laramie, Wyoming, uh, for her work. But there's a Nazarene church there as well that she'll be plugging into. And uh, we want to just ask that the Lord continue to use her as He moves her there. And so, church, we just want to leave her with that blessing this morning of commission. Um, thankful for all that she's done here, and that will continue as she moves there. So if you can, just reach out a hand, and we're just going to ask the Lord's anointing upon her this morning. Father, we thank you for Barbara in these last two years that she has been a part of our church and everything that she has contributed, her call that you've put on her life, her passion and her heart for you, and as that reflects in how she serves in the church as she loves her community. And we just pray as she begins this week the move to Wyoming, Lord, people need Jesus there too. And you're going to continue to use her. We just ask your anointing upon her life. May you just bless uh, her new steps that she takes, the church that she'll get plugged into, that they will recognize uh, your call on her life and that she will be able to uh, step right into uh, where her heart is, where you've called her to do, and that she will right away begin to see the fruit. And we just ask that you would go before her in the protection that she uh, will have all the provisions that she needs. You've planned every step of this, and you know it. You know the way that we take and we're thankful for that this morning. And so, Holy Spirit, just continue to work through Barbara as she continues to surrender to the call in her life. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, you may be seated. We do invite, um, immediately following our service, outside here, we're going to have, um, we have some cupcakes to celebrate Barbara leaving. Um, so, I know, isn't that crazy? To appreciate, to celebrate. Man, that just sounded really bad. Let's, uh, 
to celebrate all that she has done here. Uh, let me reword that, because that, I wonder how... That's probably how Elijah said it to Elisha when he was leaving. See you, dude. Uh, <laughs> good luck, pal. <laughs> I don't know how that went, but, but yes, please join us as we celebrate in uh, this after service right outside here. So, I want to make a comment. So, next next week we are going to be. Um, Starting a, a 40 day journey together, I, I want to give you some heads up of kind of what we're going to be doing. That way, you this week can just begin to pray for this. Next Sunday, we're going to be starting off uh, a 40 day journey called Praying for the Lost. And um, we're going to have some interactions in various ways through our Facebook page, through our time together. And um, Every day for 40 days, uh, there will be on our Facebook page a, a prompting um, way to pray and focus um, as we do this. And I, I hope and invite you to really take part in this because uh, I feel in my heart um, the focus of this is so critical for, the, for a church. I always like to try to do this um, at least once a year, try to find a time at least once a year we really focus in. But it doesn't mean that after 40 days you quit praying for the lost, though. Um, the, the, the focus is, is, to, is to re-engage as a church. Um, really, Luke 19.10, Jesus said, I came to seek and save the lost. I mean, there's a lot of things that, that churches spend their time on other than seeking and saving the lost. Um, unfortunately, that's just the reality. And I really believe... The, the heart of Christ and the core of the gospel is that we are diligently uh, focusing on how are we praying for the people in our lives that are lost. And so next Sunday, we're going to begin that, and we're going to focus on about four weeks together in the book of Jonah. This was the thought that, that the Lord had given me um, a couple of weeks ago, before we before uh, vac vacation, the direction I just felt the Lord say was the story of Jonah. And as I began to think about and pray about that, this is what the this is this is just the one statement that the Lord showed me about the life of Jonah is that it is a story about the reluctant prophet who meets the relentless pursuer. And um, as the, the more and more I thought about that, you know. Our lives sometimes, we seem like we live in reluctance to the people who need Jesus. Like we're not sure how we do this, or, or, or should we? Or, um, and, and the more I thought about it, it's, it's really hard. It's really hard to pray for the lost, the people you know, at the same time as Jonah did, to talk against them. In other words, um, we can't do that at the same time simultaneously. Our heart for the lost has to be the heart for the lost. And I want us to, to, to grab a hold of that as we study the book and the life of Jonah as one who, the one who was uh, reluctant met the one who was relentless. And, and God really had a heart for Nineveh and, and the people there. And God has a heart for people today. And so we're going to begin that next Sunday. I want to just invite you to really, uh, really take serious and press into the next the four weeks that we do this together and the praying. Um, what you're going to do, and as we begin this, you're going to begin to work on some names, praying the Lord show you names of family members and friends um, that really need the Lord. And um, we're going to spend time together praying for these individuals uh, on Sundays. Um, our focus for four weeks on Sunday here and our prayer time is going to be these names. And, and I hope that as we do this, you will then make that a, a commitment to continue past 40 days. But we're really going to focus in on making a habit of thinking about uh, partaking in the mission of God's heart and um, what it means to pray and to then witness and, and give testimony and what God has done in our lives to share with people who are lost. So that's where we're going to be going here 
uh, next Sunday, and I'm excited about what what Jesus just wants to do in us uh, to reach the people around us. And so, this morning, we'll see where we go with this. I I I really didn't have all of this together, um, and I still really don't think I have it all together. But that's all right. Um, but I just have some thoughts that are in my mind um, about the church today. Matthew chapter 16. I, I want you to open there with me real quick. Matthew chapter 16. And, and in case you're wondering, um, Susan thought this was a sippy cup. <laughs> she... She, she's up here before service, and it's sitting there. And it, I guess it does. From, you know, you kind of look at the side, and you would think, you know. And, and she, she looks at me and says, Pastor, do you have a sippy cup? And I, I said, I do. What are you going to say? <laughs> no, no, she. <laughs> no. Matthew chapter 16. As we sing that song this morning, the sense of, here I bow, Jesus be glorified. Jesus asked this question, we've, we've, we've heard it before, but he asked his disciples this question as he was um, traveling through the region of Caesarea Philippi. The question was, 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 who do people say the Son of Man is? You know, people are talking about uh, who I am, and, and so what are you guys hearing? I really like this question, I, I really do. Um, you know, people today, I ask people, you know, you get, begin to have conversations with people, and, and really the, the essence of the question we need to get from people is, who, who do they believe Jesus is? I mean, most of the time, you can ask people about Jesus, and, and they can tell you something. Um, whether it's he's that, he's that guy in the portrait with blue eyes and <laughs> And the long, flowy hair, I'm just like, I mean, Jesus was, was born over the Middle East. I don't think he was white with blue eyes and blonde hair, but that's just, that's just me. <laughs> but people say that. Who was Jesus? Well, he, you know, he, he was this good teacher. You know, people remember from history. You know, he was a guy that, he was, he was like, you know, Mother Teresa. He, he did a lot of good for people. And this question Jesus asked his disciples, and, 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 and they're hearing people give responses. But Simon, Simon Peter, gave the response, and he said, you're the Messiah. And this was huge. Because if you look at the answer that Jesus said to him, he said, you're blessed, Simon, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you, you did not learn this from human being. Man did not teach Simon Peter that Jesus was the Messiah. It was revelation that the Father had given Peter that Jesus was the Messiah. And as I was thinking about this recently, you know, we, we really do have to live, as the church, as believers, we have to live off revelation from the Father. Because how do we grow in, in knowing who Jesus is? It is through the time of revelation that we spend that the Father teaches us. And so Peter didn't get this because, because I told him, because you told him. People don't realize and come to the point of seeing who Jesus really is because I go and tell them this is who Jesus is. They have to receive by revelation the Father works in people's hearts of who Jesus is. You and I, though, have to show up. And we have to live like Jesus so that people will know this is who Jesus is. It's important that we do that. But what I really want you to, to see this morning is the significance that Jesus wants people to receive the revelation that he's the Messiah. And the Father does this in people's hearts. But we do have to go, just like he says in 1 Corinthians 3, we have to either we're watering or we're planting seeds, Paul says, but God makes it grow. And so P Peter answers this question, but then in verse 18, this is where I, I want us to think about today, really. 
is that Jesus said, now I say to you that you're Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I want you to think about this morning, this, this verse, verse 18, where Jesus says, I will build my church. Father, we need this morning revelation, continued revelation, continued uh, seeking of what this means for us today. As we study the revealed word, you then begin to help us understand maybe things that you still want to remind us and show us that the word is for us today. And this question, who do you say I am? And Peter's response leading to the statement that we see here by Jesus that he will build his church. And what does that mean for us today? It's so important. And we need help to really get this and to be challenged today that you are still building your church today. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. I was thinking recently about the last five five months. I think that's March, what, March, April, May, June? Yeah, almost the last five months since COVID. And, you know, everything just kind of went, went apart for churches. And we had to, we had to figure out how do, we, how do we keep having services and um, how are we going to keep people engaged and, and how are we going to just continue to function as, as we were used to. And one of the things that I, I really believe in my heart is that COVID provided an opportunity for the church to see how even if we can't physically meet in a building, the mission is the same. Bear with me as I, as I share some thoughts here. I believe with all my heart in the importance of people gathering in the local church. God blesses us with facilities to meet, to minister out of, to come together and do what we're called to. But I don't want us to get to such a point where it only happens because of a physical location of coming here. In other words, the mission revolves around what happens here. I, I, I thought of it this week that, and there's a lot of illustrations that Jesus used. I mean, I mean Paul writes in his books about the church, you know, about Jesus, the head of the body, and um, the cornerstone. We're going to look at some of these scriptures here in a second. Uh, about, a build, but about a building, about a body, and he uses these ways to express what Jesus represents. Paul didn't use this one, um, but I'm going to give Paul another one that he probably should have used. <laughs> but the way I, I looked at it this week, one of the things I thought about was a boat. And there are a lot of people lost at sea. And the church is the boat that goes out. And we're not trying to wait for people to come swim to the rescue boat, but rather we're throwing out the rescue to them. In other words, we're, we're, we're coming for you. We're not going to pull the boat up and then there's all the people in the water stranded and, and we're just going to sit here and say, well, if you want rescued, come swim to us. And that, that's how I thought about the, the, the church because the word for church that is used uh, Matthew 16, if, if you never heard the word, it's called ekklesia. The, the, the Greek word is ekklesia. And really, this word ekklesia was a modern term that Jesus used. This was a common term that would have just simply meant a group of people gathering together. It wasn't anything extraordinary. It wasn't anything significant. It wasn't like Jesus made up a new word for the church. He used a common word to describe what he was going to build, ekklesia. In other words, a gathering of citizens, and as we unpack the New Testament, we build upon what that means. So when we talk about Jesus will build his church, that church part 
It really means for us, it's a gathering of citizens who understand Jesus is the Messiah and we are living his mission. That's what the church is. I don't care if it's Baptist, Methodist, Nazarene. That that doesn't matter. What matters is that we understand that we are citizens who have been called to gather for the purpose to understand that Jesus is the Messiah. That's Remember what Jesus said to Peter. Upon this rock, he said, I will build my church. And there's been a lot of interpretations over time about what does that mean? Is Peter the rock? Does that mean Peter was the first bishop of the church? Is the church based on Peter? The more I study that, my conclusion, what Jesus was saying, is that the rock that he was going to build upon is the revelation that Peter received that Jesus is the Messiah. The church, is, the church was birthed upon, was built upon revelation that Jesus is the Messiah. Which means, if we are ecclesia, if the body of Christ is the ecclesia, it means we are gathered together for the purpose of making sure people receive the revelation that Jesus is the Messiah. Everything past that is secondary. And I think so much in in, in, in ministry and for churches, there's a lot of that we try to do. But really, the focus has to be that there is a revealing that Jesus is the Messiah and that people need to know that he is the Messiah. And that's our mission then. And so COVID provided an opportunity, I believe, for us to really examine that even if we can't gather in a physical place together, it doesn't stop the ecclesia. It doesn't stop the mission that we have. Each of us is a part of that mission. And so that means we can continue to serve the people in our community continue to meet needs of people in our community, continue to reveal the love of Jesus to the people in our community, even though we can't come here physically. I'm thankful for the church, the, our, our local church, that we can come and we can receive the time to worship together and instruction together and fellowship through things together. But let's not let that keep from seeing how also we're called to gather and to continue the mission every day as we live for Jesus. The statement that Jesus made, I will build my church, it's the foundation for us. If you've seen the movie, has anyone seen the movie, Remember the Titans? You remember that movie? Um, Incredible movie, one of my favorite, but there's a line in it, I just, I, Love this line. I, I keep thinking about it when I think about this statement that Jesus made. Um, they're getting ready to get onto some buses to go to a camp. This is a black and white schools integrating, and they're going to their first camp. And Coach Herman Boone um, was the new uh, African American coach that was going to be a part of the team, um, and he is going to be given uh, at some point the the head coach position, and so. They're getting ready to get on the bus, and two of the uh, white students come up and are talking to him about, you know, we don't need any of your players on, on, on our side. You know, we're good. And uh, he, he asked Gary Bertier, <laughs> is, this, is the player's name, and he, he says, is this your team or is this your daddy's team? And Gary says, it's, it's your team. It's such an, I think it's such an incredible moment in the movie Because there is in that very minute a foundation that was placed that this is not just your team. And I'm the one, uh, Coach Boone said, "It's, it's my team and it's our team. And that was the foundation for them to know that he was the one. And I I think of that statement, and I think of Jesus. This is, I will build my church. And it isn't my church. It isn't your church. It's Jesus' church. And 
oftentimes we use language in church where, where we talk about this is my church. And I have to even sometimes back up and say, you know, this is the church that I am a part of, the local church. Because it, it isn't my church. It isn't your church. Because Jesus said, I will build the church. So only one person can have ownership of the church. It can't be multiple people. Because the foundation is the revelation of Jesus as the Messiah. Not the revelation of Jamie McBride and whatever he, he wants to say. And I think it's important that we get that, that we remember today. The statement that Jesus made, I will build my church. The statement I, number one, the statement I represents for us that Christ has lordship over the, over the church, the ecclesia. He is Lord. He's number one. Everything we do comes back to him. The second statement he says is I will. Uh, that will part means that Christ has the authority. All authority, he said, has been given to me, Matthew 28. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And so the church, the authority of the church, and what happens is Christ alone. And then he gives us to partner with him with that authority when he commissions us. You see, you're commissioned with authority because of Jesus. So that means when he says, I will build my church, that means when Jesus gives you authority to help build the church, we better take seriously that we are helping build his church. We have been also can share in that. That word build then, uh, he said, I will build. Uh, this represents what Christ was going to do. What was the work going to be for Christ? And a couple places we find Jesus, John 4, 34, John 5, 17, Jesus makes these comments. My work is to, to do that which the Father shows me. My food is, is that to which my Father gives. So his life was all about, here's what my Father's doing, and here's what I do then. So when he talks about build, when he's going to build the ecclesia, when he's going to build the gathering of believers, that means there has to be given revelation that Jesus is the Messiah, because that was the mission, Luke 19, 10, I mentioned it, to come and to seek and save the lost. So the purpose of the church, I love this, guys, the work of the church, in essence, is to complete what Jesus said, what the Father has said to me to do, what he's given me to do, that's what I have done. And we have to mirror that. We have to live that exact same building that people need to know that Jesus is the Messiah. Amen? I will build... And then he says, my, which means he has possession of the church. I want to break this down real quick. There's a couple of places I want to go with this, so let's uh, look at a few scriptures. Look at Acts chapter 20, verse 25. Acts chapter 20, verse 25. So Paul, we're kind of getting down to where uh, this is a part of one of Paul's travels. Going to Jerusalem, verse 22, gives us this indication. And so in verse 25, Paul gives this testimony. And now I know that none of you to whom I have preached the kingdom will ever see me again. And I declare today that I have been faithful. If anyone suffers eternal death, it's not my fault. Do you ever look at your responsibility <laughs> when you are a part of the building of the church? What Christ has done, you have a responsibility for people who are lost. Have you ever thought about that? That's what Paul says here. I have preached, I have been faithful to preach the kingdom. If anyone suffers eternal death, it's not my fault. 
for I didn't shrink from declaring all that God wants you to know. You see, there's, there is such an importance today, church, in declaring the gospel and declaring who Jesus is and the need of why Jesus came to people. Because if we don't do that to them, then it is on us of the eternal punishment that awaits people that if they don't know about it, then we can't say like Paul did, if anyone suffers eternal death, it's not my fault. Because I presented and preached to you the full gospel. I preached to you who Jesus was and why he came and your need for him. If you continue, he says in verse 28, so guard yourselves in God's people. Feed and shepherd God's flock, his church purchased with his own blood. The question number one I, I want you to think about this morning. Would the Son of God have been willing to endure the suffering he went through for such a meaningless thing? Is the church meaningless today? Because according to Paul, the church was purchased with his blood. His life gave the purchase of who we are today, the church, the ecclesia. If he was willing to sacrifice himself for the church, then that's the call of a disciple of Jesus Christ then, to lay down your life and follow me. But do we take that seriously? Do we take seriously the same thing that Jesus saw to pay his blood for the church? If you think about Ephesians 5.25, Paul gives the illustration that Christ is the head of the church. And he gave himself up for her, just like a husband for his, to love his wife, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Christ loved the church that he gave his life for her. And that's the same call that we have as the ecclesia today, is that there are people who need to know that Jesus is the Messiah for them. And we have a responsibility to go and to take that message. If you look at Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. It, it says this, Paul says, And God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body, it is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. And so in also Colossians chapter 1 verse 18 Paul says the same uh, same statement that he is that Christ is the head of the church. Now if you think about this if there's a head of something if you think of an organization, not that I want to look at the church in the sense of an organization, but if you look at an organization, there's always somebody at the top. There's always someone that has the important job and significant job of being at the top. And, and most of the time when I think about this position, I, I, I would never want that position. <laughs> I mean, you know, we can look at that and think about all the trickling down the leadership role and whatnot into businesses, but if you really stop and thought about the person who's at the very top, I wouldn't want that responsibility in, in most cases. There's a lot that comes with that. And so if there has to be a head of something, that means that that person's role has significance. And, and Paul says, Christ is the head of the church, <laughs> That's what Jesus said. I will build my church. I am going to be the CEO, the COO, whatever else you have at the bottom. He's going to be all of it. I am the head of the church. And so get this with me. So Paul says he's the head 
of the body. And the church is the body. So all of us, Paul made this clear to us in 1 Corinthians that we are the body, which means some of us are arms and some of us are legs, some of us are ears and some of us are noses and elbows, whatever you want to say, fill in the blank. We make up a, a body and he talks about it in a physical body. Now, imagine with me if we had a body that had no head. <laughs> what, what function would we have? <laughs> the, the, the only thing I've ever seen that, keep, that keeps moving around without their head is a chicken. I've, I've heard chickens will keep running around with their heads chopped off. <laughs> I've never seen it, but I've always wanted to, so... I, I have a neighbor that has some chickens, and I thought about an experiment would be in hand, but <laughs> don't think they would like me doing that, although it would make for a good meal later if, after we did it. But bear with me and in, in, in imagine if your body had no head. <laughs> imagine if it was just a head and no body. And, and, and that's what Paul is, is trying to get us to get our minds wrapped around that, that the church needs the head. That's Christ. And Christ needs the body, which is us. Re, re, just read it again. That he is the head over all things for the benefit, the benefit of the church. The church is benefited when Christ is the head. What happens when the church moves him from that position? We lose the benefit of what we are and what we can do. He is the head. We are made full and complete because of Christ. Without Christ, we're not full, we're not complete, we're nothing. I challenge us as, as a local church, but I challenge the church at large today to think about if Christ is not the head, if Christ is not at the top, if he is not the Lord, then we are not complete and we're not full. We're empty, we're missing something, and we're incomplete. And that type of church has nothing to give to a world that's lost. A church that's not full and complete. Why we have to keep Christ at all times as the head. If you look over in Ephesians chapter 2, just go over a chapter and read verse 20 with me. Very similar again. Verse 20, he says that together we are a house. Members, all of us are members of God's family, and we're a house built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, but this is the cornerstone, it's Christ himself. And if, if you've done any kind of building before, if you know about building, what's the significance of the cornerstone? Everything. Everything. How we build, the direction we build, everything that is key upon the structure. And so the strength, the, the strength of a building is, is only as good as the foundation that we build it on. The strength of the church is only as good as the foundation that we build it on. If it's not Christ then we're not building on who said would be the foundation. I will build my church. And I love that second part. We're not going to get into it much today, but I love that. And the powers of hell or the gates of, of Hades will not prevail against it. You see, the church, growing up, I always kind of saw the church as this place that, that Christians had to come and retreat to and get protection from the world. But that's not what Jesus said. Because it's, it's, it's the gates of Hades that will not prevail against the church. Which means the church, is the ecclesia, is the one that is always living on offense. 
It's the church that is always moving. It's the church that should always be progressing against the enemy. It's not the other way around. The church is not retreating and trying to keep protected from the world. And, and that's how we, a lot of us maybe grew up, is that we, we have to, as the church, protect ourselves from the evil world around us. But that's not what Jesus shows when he says, the church that I want to build is going to be a church that presses back against hell, that presses back against the powers of darkness. It's the church that is going to take ground away from what the enemy's done to us. That's the church that Jesus wants to build. So the strength of the church only comes when Jesus is the foundation and we're doing what Jesus called us to do. If he's not the cornerstone, then the church as itself is not going to stand much or long. Our foundation is weak. Many cornerstones of churches today is not Jesus. Sometimes it's people who've been in the church a long time. And we say, that's the pillar. <laughs> that's who it is. Or it's this or it's that. But can I say with, with love in my heart, really, that if Christ is not the cornerstone, our church is not strong, nor will it last. Christ has to be the foundation, the cornerstone of what we do. Look at what Paul said, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This is my last, uh, last picture of this for us. So And then we're going to sing a song, a good song here about we are the church. 1 Corinthians 3.11, Paul says this, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has already been laid, and that is Jesus Christ. There's one foundation that's been laid. And Paul knew what that foundation was. And he says to be very careful then of how we build, because we want to build on the foundation that is Jesus. So my last question then, comes from a statement then that Paul made in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. But the last statement, uh, question really, if the church, if the church isn't necessary, if, if someone wants to make that claim, someone were to come to you and, and say that, you know, the church isn't necessary. Paul had this to say about why the church was necessary. Just, just, Think about this, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, he makes this statement, God's purpose in all of this, he's talking about the mystery of God's plan, which, which was the church from the beginning, the mystery of the church. He says, God's purpose in all of this was to use the church to display his wisdom and its rich variety in all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places and this was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Jesus Christ, our Lord. This was the plan all along. From the beginning, God in his mind had the church. And Jesus Christ was going to be the one that was the foundation through Christ. I will build my church, Jesus said. And for what purpose? So that through the church, he could display his wisdom and its rich variety to not only who is seen, but think about this, also to teach those who are unseen. Angels and demonic realms both are looking and watching the church. We think angels are cool. Angels think the church is cool. <laughs> the angels are seeing what the church is doing today. And they're in awe of it. That's what Paul says here. There is significance in the church today, which means for us, for you and I, we have to get this. And we have to realize that my place as a body of Christ 
is significant. The church today is significant for the community that they're a part of. I will build my church. I've seen businesses, even here locally since I've been here, businesses that were here for a long time, guess what they do? They close up. They shut down. They move on. Someone else may come in. But do you know what has always been since Christ, the ecclesia? People may have to close down a building. They may have to use someone else's facility. The church that uh, Barbara's going to in Wyoming, they use another facility. It's not their own, but they use. But I remember I looked at that. As soon as she said that, I, I looked up the church and just did a quick little see. And, and I was like, Barbara's going to love this church because they meet Sunday nights and they have a van ministry that goes out and does all sorts of things in the community. Takes people to appointments, feeds people. I mean, they, I mean, they're literally doing um, what they're supposed to. They meet together, though, in a place that's, that they rent and they have worship. And so it doesn't matter. The point is, the ecclesia will always be because Jesus is building his church still. My thing is, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of what Jesus is building. And I want to invite you to be a part of that as well. Father, we thank you for our call. And as Paul said, uh, some people in the Corinth church were saying, well, I follow Apollos and I follow Paul and and." He even says, that doesn't matter. I mean, some will, some will water and, and some will plant, but it is Christ who makes it grow. And so there is one foundation that's been laid. Jesus, that's you. And even if, because of COVID-19, even if we can't meet in those months that we couldn't meet, one thing that the enemy can't do is take away the mission that we still have. And so, Jesus, you said you will build your church, and you are still building it, and we want to be a part of that. We want to be partakers in building what you started. And so, this morning, we just have that invitation, and as we sing this song, As we sing this song and we think about we are the church, we are the hope on earth, may we take seriously that responsibility and calling because, Jesus, you took seriously the church enough to give your life for. And so we also give our lives to serve through the church. We pray this in your name. Amen. I invite you to stand as we close and say, uh, build your kingdom here.
can stop your beauty changing hearts and Jesus that's what you said that the church would not be prevailed against and so we desire to see lives reached lives transformed to see our neighborhoods and next Sunday father as as we as we think about the people that we know in our lives people that are close to us maybe a neighbor family member and we think of these names of people. And most important, there is a hole in their heart, Jesus, that is not filled with the knowledge of the revelation that you're the Messiah that loves them. And so there's some work to do, as always. There's building to be done. And Jesus, we want to build as you built. And as you're building today, we become partakers of it. So as we just sang, release your power within us and all that we do, and all that we say for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And we'll see you guys next week.